Father, that uh, you're here with us and that you're uh, in us. I just thank you, Lord, that, uh, man, we can just, uh, man, just experience your life today, that we could just have our eyes opened to uh, the way in which you bring forth life in us, that we can just feel at rest, we could feel comforted, that we could uh, just see all the stumbling blocks that um, are, are working against us, experiencing your peace and your joy kicked out of the way, that we can just find uh, any hurdles that uh, are keeping us from uh, experiencing your life just kicked out of the way. Thank you, Father, that it's your good pleasure, that it's your joy um, to serve us with your life. It's your good pleasure, it's your joy to move everything out of the way that's a hindrance to us. And I just thank you, Lord, that the word today can just uh, release your strength in the people's hearts. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Um, the name of the message is, Where's the Peace? You know, Where's the Peace? And I just, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some, something that can be a hindrance to us experiencing the life that, that God sent Jesus to give us. Something that can be a hindrance to us experiencing the peace and joy that, that Jesus came to give us. And maybe it's just me, but as I walked um, as, I, as I heard the word of grace and then walked in the word of grace and continued to walk in the word of grace, there were, there were some times where I didn't feel as if I was experiencing the peace and joy of God as much as I thought I should have been experiencing it, right? You know, I hear this message of grace and you get happy at first and you're experiencing this peace and this joy. And then as I continued to walk in that grace, there were times where I didn't feel like I was experiencing as much peace and joy as I thought I should have been. And I would think things in my heart like, where's the peace, man? You know, and I just want to talk a little bit about that because if we don't understand the things that can keep us from experiencing the peace, we can make a conclusion that the word of grace doesn't work. And we can find our hearts wanting to go back to Egypt, right? We can find ourselves turning away from it. And in my own life, I walked through that, where there were times where I wasn't experiencing the life of God, the life that I knew God had come to give me, and I didn't know why I wasn't experiencing it. And then God would come and just reveal what was working against me, what was a hindrance. You know, I'd cry out to God all the time, where's the peace, man? I'm living in this grace, I'm walking in this grace, where's the peace, what gives? You know, it's like that, uh, it just comes to my mind, it was like that, I think it was a Wendy's commercial. You guys remember that old Wendy's commercial with the grandma that w would go through the drive through and get the hamburger, and she's all, where's the beef? <laughs> you guys remember that commercial? I mean, there's been times when I've been in the grace, and I've been walking around, and man, it, where's the peace? You know, like, you open up the, the sandwich, and there ain't no peace there, you know? And then you're like, what am I busy with if I can't have the peace? What's the deal here, man? You know, and... And, and so I don't think it's an uncommon thing for, uh, for people to find themselves in that place sometimes. I actually think it's a very common thing. I think it's a thing that can very easily happen. And so I just want to talk about some things I experienced in my life. And I just want to talk about the way that, that God brings forth his fruit in us. So we can just get an understanding of what that looks like. Because then we can also see what can be a hindrance to us experiencing the fruit of his life. Or what can be a hindrance to us seeing his fruit come forth in us. And, you know, just for me, it was as simple as me just seeing what was going on. And God just coming and, and just showing me, here's why, man. Oh, glory to God. Bam. And then all of a sudden, I found the peace and the joy return. So I just think in, in grace, we just want to have eyes to understand these things and, and see what's going on. And just understand something about grace. Grace isn't, it's not something that, it's not like something that you hear once and you say, oh, I get it. And then that's all you need to have peace and joy. It's not like a mathematical equation. It's not like 2 plus 2, where once you understand 2 plus 2 equals 4, you get it and you move on, and you don't need to be reminded every day that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Grace is, isn't something that we're going to learn, and then after we learn it, we're going to say, well, that's it. I don't need to hear it anymore. I've learned it. I've got it. And then we're going to move on, and that's all we needed was to hear it, to get it, to learn it, and then that's it, and we move on, and that's all we need to have peace and joy. That's not how grace works. Grace is designed to be the meditation of our hearts. It's designed to be in the forefront of our thoughts every day. 
It's designed to be able to dwell in us to the degree that when we walk around in life, our thoughts are all the time filled with grace. Our thoughts are all the time filled with the word of life where everything we see, everything we view, we're viewing it and filtering it through the grace that has come to us in Jesus. Right? It's supposed to get stuck inside of you, stuck in your head to the degree that it's always in there. Like, uh, like you ever had a song get stuck in your head? Where the song you hear somewhere and all of a sudden it's stuck in your head and you go through the whole rest of the day and the song keeps coming up. The song keeps coming up. The song keeps coming up and you can't get the song out of your head. It's just there. You see, grace is designed to be that way. It isn't a thing we learn. You see, I think so many times we come to to church and we think we're hearing messages and we're trying to intellectually understand something so that we can have it in our toolbox and we know we have it and then that's it and we think that's it. But that's not how it works. It's something we're designed to be reminded of daily, daily. We're designed to be reminded of the grace that has come to us in Jesus. That way, it can become the meditation of our heart. And that's why we hear messages. We're hearing messages so that our hearts can be confronted with the word of life that's come to us in Christ. And then that word of life can become the meditation of our hearts. And we're walking around all the time just thinking about it. You ever daydreamed where you just find your mind wandering on something and you're just lost in that? That's how the word of life is. That's how the word of life is designed to work. That's how grace is designed to work. It's designed to become like the daydream in your heart where even when you're going to work, you're walking in work and your thoughts are animated by the grace of God. It's thinking about the grace of God. It's viewing everything through the grace of God. It's viewing everything through life. It's discerning everything that it sees around you through life. That's how grace is designed to be. You know, and, and so I think sometimes we, we look at grace more like an academic process. You know, where we're going to get a degree, and once we get the degree, it's that degree that's going to give us peace and joy. But we're a living human being. And as a living human being, we're not an academic exercise. And so we're designed to find this grace all the time actuating our thoughts and dwelling in our thoughts and dwelling in our hearts. And that's the way that grace brings forth fruit in us. It doesn't bring forth fruit in us the way an academic exercise would be. Okay? The degree isn't the fruit. Okay? We're not trying to get a degree in grace. Listen, we could say I know a whole lot intellectually about grace. And every day, I hear more grace. In fact, most people would say, Greg, you know enough about grace. You don't need to know more about grace. You need to move on from grace. And let me tell you something. What I find is every day, I'm thinking about the grace. Every day, I'm thinking about the word of life. And I'm not doing it as a work. I'm not getting up in the morning and saying, well, the good and the right thing to do is to dwell on the word of grace. That's not how it is. It's that my imagination has been captivated by the word of what God has done in Christ to conquer death and bring forth eternal life. My heart has been captivated by that. And my heart was designed to be captivated by that. So that that word of what God has done can dwell in my heart and it can become the meditation of my heart. And my heart is all the time twisting on it, turning on it, examining it, thinking about it, dwelling on it. And then through that, that's where the fruit of God comes forth. Glory to God. So many times we think, well, I heard grace on Sunday, or I heard grace a couple years ago, and now that's all, I get it. And now we move on. And then we wonder why we don't have the peace and the joy. Listen, when you wake up thirsty, you're not thinking, I drank a glass of water yesterday. Why do I need a glass of water today? (laughs) And so every day, we're designed for the meditation of our heart To be the grace, the word of grace that's come to us in Christ. And when that word of grace that's come to us in Christ can be the meditation of our heart, it is like a tree of life to us, bringing forth God's fruit in our lives, bringing forth God's peace and God's joy. Okay? So glory to God. And we'll we'll get to what meditation is, but meditation is not a work. You, You guys are meditating right now and you're not even trying to. You, you know what I'm saying? Right now, you, you're thinking something about me. You're thinking something about yourself, something about God, something about why am I here? What am I doing? I mean, you're thinking something, right? <laughs> Glory to God. You ain't trying to do that either, are you? You're sitting there thinking something. That's meditation, okay? What well, God made you that way. 
He made you that way that you would all the time be thinking on something. And what else He made you was for Him to be able to come and plant His Word of life inside of you so that that would be the thing you were always twisting on. And then that would animate your whole spirit, soul, and body with His life. Glory to God. So grace ain't a glass of water. It ain't like, well, I had grace yesterday, so I don't need grace today. No, each day, the Word of grace is what you need to have peace and joy. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Um, and so we're, what we're going to look at here, and I don't have the clicker. Mom, do you have the clicker back there? Oh, wait, I didn't give you any verses. Never mind. Um, you won't be able to, uh, you guys are thinking that guy doesn't have it together. You're right. I think I said it before. I don't have any marketing skills. I don't have any administration skills. I don't have any organization skills. I don't have any technology skills. I don't have any communication skills. I'm not even a good speaker, but I see Jesus. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I see Jesus. And so, listen, that will make up for a multitude of sins. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you see Jesus. Glory to God. <laughs> um, so we're going to look at, you know, I love looking at verses that everybody knows because it makes it easy. But we're going to look at uh, the parable of the sower sowing the seed and just kind of pull something out of there and look at how it can affect us, especially in grace, how it can affect us. Because sometimes we look at that parable and we think, well, that can only affect like, you know, immature Christians or if you've fallen away from grace. But many times it, it can affect people that are steeped in grace, that understand grace, that, that, that love grace. And, and before they know it, they're, they're not seeing the grace work and they don't know why. And so we'll look at Mark. Um, we'll read the passages in Mark. And um, we're not going to read the whole parable. We'll start with Mark chapter 4, verse 14. And then we'll go through like verse 19, and we'll, uh, we'll hit on that. So the parable of the sower sowing the seed. It says, the sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And we're going we're gonna to focus in on the last two verses there, verse 18 and 19. And um, we'll just read them again right now. It says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Hear the word of grace. That word hear means something. It means you heard that thing. You grasped what it is. You didn't just hear it and it was like, what? No, you heard the thing. You, you saw what that is, okay? So to some degree, you heard the word. You, you had some understanding of the word. And then look what it says. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful in your life. Okay? So you heard the word of grace. You heard the word of life. And then these other things came in and choked that word. And that word became unfruitful in your life. So that kind of describes where I'd been at times where it didn't seem like the word or that grace was producing fruit. And it, I know a lot of other people um, are just like me and, and have experienced the same thing. And so just to summarize those verses a little bit, God sat with the desire to bring forth his life in us. He sat with the desire to bring forth his fruit in us. And the thing that he did to bring forth his life in us the thing that he did to bring forth his fruit in us is that he came and planted the word of life that is Jesus in our hearts. He came and planted the word of life that is Jesus in the earth. Okay, Jesus is the seed. Jesus is the seed God came to plant in our hearts and plant in the earth so that we could have peace and joy, so that we could find ourselves experience in his life. Jesus is that seed. Okay, so God's come in Jesus. He's come to sow. Now, we could say Jesus is the sower, but really Jesus is the word of God. God is the sower. He sowed a seed. The seed he sowed is Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the word God came to sow. Okay, so Jesus, God, God 
God came in Jesus to sow the word of life in our hearts so that word can dwell in us and be a tree of life to us. And then Jesus says that there's something that can be a stumbling block to us experiencing the peace and joy that, that he's come to give us. There's something that can be a stumbling block that can act as a choker, you know, like a wrestler puts somebody in a chokehold. There's something that can choke out that word's ability to produce its fruit in you. And that thing he called it the cares of the world. The cares of the world can come in and choke out the power of that word of life that the Father has sowed to produce peace and joy in you. It can kind of make that word unfruitful. It can become of no effect in your life, meaning you're not seeing the fruit of it. It's just like what Paul said to the Galatians when he he came and, and put Christ and him crucified on display right in front of them. And the Judaizers came and told him, yeah, that's wonderful, but you've got to be circumcised in the foreskin of your flesh in order to be justified. Paul came in and said, listen, man, Christ has become of no effect in your life because you're trying to be justified through the flesh. And so because they took on this idea that they had to bring forth life and be justified through their works, it choked out the power of the word that Paul had preached. Paul wasn't saying they lost their salvation and now they were going to hell. He was saying, listen, man, you guys aren't going to experience the kingdom of God within. And the kingdom of God within is peace, love, joy, kindness, long-suffering, meekness, faithfulness, uh, patience, all those kinds of things. That's what Paul was talking about in Galatians 5 there. When he says these people have no part in the kingdom of God, he wasn't talking heaven and hell. He was talking about experiencing the life of God in your heart. If you walk after the flesh... You ain't going to experience peace because the flesh doesn't possess ability to bring you peace. Glory to God, man. We've got to get our eyes off this heaven-hell thing and just realize that it's about life and death, okay? And are we experiencing life or are we experiencing death? Now, God has come to sow a word, and that word is the word of life, and that word of life is Jesus. He's come to plant that into our heart so that that word can be planted in our heart, and that seed can grow up into a tree of life. It can be cultivated, it can be watered, and it can become a tree of life in us, producing the fruit of God's life in us. Glory to God. But Jesus says there's some things that try to work against that word and keep it from doing what it do in your life. And the thing he points to at the end there is he says the cares of the world can come and it can choke out the power of that word to bring forth its life. Okay? And so that's what we want to look at is the cares of the world. Okay? And so Jesus said it can choke out the power of the word to bring forth its fruit in us. You know, like, I don't know if you guys have like, if you ever had like a garden, but we have some like fruit trees and some fruit plants in our yard, and there's like a, a weed that, you know, each year tries to grow into the, 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 the garden or grow into the fruit plant. It tries to twist itself around the fruit plant. And it tries to, to, to cut off its ability to produce fruit. It's like a weed growing in there, and it's trying to keep those little plants we have, these little blueberry bushes we have, from being able to produce blueberries. Okay, and what Jesus is saying is that the cares of the world act like a weed that are trying to grow in the garden of your hearts. And they're trying to grow in the garden of your hearts, and they're trying to choke out the vine that is Christ that wants to produce fruit. Okay? That's what he's talking about with the cares of the world. Your heart is like a garden. And God has come to plant a seed in your heart. And that seed will produce a tree of life. And the tree of life produces this glorious fruit called peace and joy and kindness. And all those kinds of things. And Jesus says, the cares of the world are as if a weed has climbed up into your heart and it's trying to choke out the vine that produces God's peace and joy. Okay? That's what he's talking about when he talks about the cares of the world. It's like a nasty weed that's got to be plucked out. Right? That, that keeps the vine from producing fruit. So what, what are the cares of the world? And, and how do we want to define the cares of the world and you know, we could give an easy explanation, but you know me, I like to give comp- difficult explanations. Um, I apologize for that, but I'll try to give a, I tried to write down a simple one here, first of all, the, the cares of the world. What are the cares of the world? The cares of the world are things in this world we think we need to experience peace, love, joy, kindness, long-suffering, patience, all those kinds of things. That's the cares of the world. It's the things we think we need to have peace and joy. And the things we think we need to have peace and joy are things in the world. That's the cares of the world, 
okay? It's talking about you, there's a life that's in the world, you know, there's a, there's a certain life from the world. There's a life you can gain from the world. There's a life that is of the world. The cares of the world is that the things that pertain to that life have come knocking on your door, right? The world says you got to have a certain amount of money to have peace. The world says you've got to have a certain job to have peace. The world says you've got to have a certain spouse to have peace. You've got to have a relationship to have peace. You've got to live in a certain area to have peace. You've got to have a certain amount of everything to have peace. That's what the world says. You've got to accomplish a certain amount of things. You've got to reach your potential. Okay, These are things that the world says you've got to have to, to have life in order to partake of peace. And so that's what the cares of the world are. Okay, it's anything that pertains to the life that is from the world. It's anything that pertains to the life that is of the world, where your heart gets set on those things as if you need that to have life. Okay, we'll use me for an example. When Becky and I first moved here, and it could be something different for everybody, but when Becky and I first moved here and we started the church, I didn't have any income. There was, I wasn't getting any money from the church because we just started the church. So Becky and I had to live with my parents. My parents are lovely, glorious people, man. They're the God kind, man. They've, they've only ever laid down their life for me. But listen, I'm, you know, I was 40 years old, and so I didn't want to live with my parents. And I had a wife, and we didn't want to live with my parents. And um, we lived there for like three and a half years. <laughs> three and a half years. You see how the cares of the world came to me? <laughs> now listen. At first, it was nice and easy. It was real easy. Oh, glory to God. I have eternal life. It doesn't matter where I live. Well, eventually, man, it started to matter where I lived. And it wasn't just like I desire to have my own place to live. There's a difference between desire and lust. But what ended up quickly happening was I began to say, in order to have peace, I need a house. In order to have joy, I need a house. In order to experience life, I need a house. Do you see? That's the cares of the world. Okay? It's one thing to say I desire a spouse. It's one thing to say I desire a job. It's one thing to say I desire this or I desire that. It's another thing when you say I need that in order to have peace and joy. Okay? That's the cares of the world. When something has come to you that's of the world, that's from the life that's in the world, that says you need this in order to have peace and joy. That's the cares of the world. And what that can do is it can act as a weed growing in your heart, choking out the power of the word to produce peace and joy in you. Okay? I knew grace. I've known grace since 96. And so this was only like, what, four, three years ago? And so I've been walking in grace since 96, man. I had many PhDs in grace. Okay, so I was well steeped in the word of grace. But because the cares of the world had come to me, the world came to me and said, Greg, your life is being corrupted, man. You don't have what you need to have life. You need to get this house, man. And if you can get this house, then you'll have peace and joy. That's the cares of the world. I became concerned with my life that was in the world. I began living as if the life that I have is the life that the world can give me. And the life that the world can give me requires a house to have peace and joy. You see? Now listen, that began choking out my joy and peace. Because every day I woke up and I didn't have no freaking house. You see what I'm saying? You see how it choked out the peace and the joy? It came and told me and said, Greg, your life is the life that's in the world, and the life that's in the world, you got to have a house to be happy, man. And so I began trying to find life from the world, and I began waking up every day judging whether I had life or not by whether I had a house or not. So my conscience became corrupted with the cares of the world. My heart became filled with the cares of the world, and that choked out the power of the word of grace to bring forth peace and joy in me. It didn't mean I lost my salvation. It didn't mean I backslidden. It didn't mean anything crazy like that. But what it meant was that my affection had gotten set on the life that the world can give me and the things that pertain to that life. And then that began choking out the word of life that spoke a different word about my life. You see how that works? Glory to God. And it isn't just, it isn't just found with, with things that... And listen, please understand what I'm saying. When I talk about the life that's in the world, I know we have our own definitions of what these things mean. 
I don't mean it's bad to go enjoy your life in the world. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about how, well, we can't go to concerts and we can't go to movies and we can't have, you know, clothes and we can't be in the fashion and we can't go to Mardi Gras and we can't go down to the French. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about defining your life by the life that's in the world, okay? I'm not talking about what we do in the world. I'm talking about what we think about life. Big difference, okay? So don't get in this dual, dual, dual thinking um, with what I said, um, Now listen, it doesn't just have to happen in the form of a house um, or the, the form of, of a job or a spouse or anything like that. It, the cares of the world can also be any area of your life where you want to see a victory. How many of us want to see a victory in an area of our life? Two people are honest. I'm joking, I'm joking. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. <laughs> but listen, there's nothing wrong with wanting to see a victory. But if the wanting to get a victory becomes the thing that you're all the time thinking of, where you wake up in the morning and your mind is all the time filled with this affliction or this struggle you have or this thing you see in your life that you think is, is keeping you from peace, if your mind becomes filled with that, if you begin thinking all the time, how can I get a victory? I need a victory. What's keeping me from victory? When will I get a victory? Will I ever get the victory? What needs to happen so I can get the victory? Do you see, if, if that becomes the meditation of your heart, that's the same as the cares of this world. Okay? Now you're no longer meditating on the word of life, but you're meditating on lack, actually. You're meditating on what you say you don't have and what you need in order to have peace. So you're not living from victory. You're living as if you still need one. And then your, your mind becomes consumed with all the time thinking about what needs to happen for you to enjoy life. And we'll look at the things in our life in that way. We'll look at them as if the things that go on in our life somehow possess the power to conquer the resurrection. And then our minds quickly become consumed with if only that could be overcome or if only this circumstance could change, then I'll have peace. Then I'll have joy. Our mind becomes fixated on our affliction. Our mind becomes fixated on some struggle we're having. And we, we begin thinking that that struggle or this circumstance or this affliction has to change in order for me to have life. That's a lie from the pit of hell. There's no affliction in this world that can overcome the life of God. God's love is not at the mercy of your circumstances. God's joy is not at the mercy of your circumstances. God's peace is not at the mercy of your circumstances. God's not sitting around thinking, well, I have this joy and this peace, but the, the world is so much greater than my joy and my peace. I know if we could just change all their circumstances, then they could have joy and peace. That's how we think. <laughs> That's how we think, man. And so we, we become, the meditation of our hearts becomes our affliction, becomes our circumstances, where we're all the time twisting on it, where every day our conversation with God is about, God, if you could just take care of this, then all will be well. You guys follow what I'm saying? Listen, guys, sometimes we get so focused on getting a victory, the meditation of our hearts becomes our struggle. And we don't even realize it because it's a normal thing to feel pressed in upon by the lack that's in the world. It's normal to feel the smack. Jesus felt the smack. He sweat blood. But then he didn't think, well, Lord, if you could only deliver me from this body of death, then I'll have life. No, no, no. He said, life is found in you, Father. And so, guys, we could be some, so consumed with the lack that presses in on us sometimes. We can be so consumed with what we think we don't have that we need that that becomes the meditation of our heart. And we're all the time twisting on it, thinking on it. When, how will it get better? When will it get better? Before we know it, we think that life is found in that thing. And some of you say, no, no, I don't think life is found in that thing. Then why do you think it has to change for you to have peace? If you think it has to change for you to have peace, whether you realize it or not, you're saying life is found in that thing. <laughs> you see, and there's nothing wrong with wanting a negative circumstance to change. There's nothing wrong with praying to God about something that's bothering you. And I'm not saying it can't change or that it won't change. 
But what I'm talking about is if it changing becomes the meditation of your heart, your heart has now been filled with the weed that wants to choke out the power of the word to bring forth peace and joy. Your heart's now begun meditating on something other than the word of life. Your, your heart has now become meditating on lack. It's now meditating on the word of death that's in the world that's trying to tell you you lack what you need to have peace. But if it, this can just change, then you'll have it. Doesn't that sound like what uh, Satan told Eve? You lack, but if you do this, then you can have. That's how the serpent can only attack our heart. The serpent ain't busy doing anything. You know what the serpent did? He saw our design. He saw we were created to have life. He saw we were never created to ever encounter death. And he said, let me get my death planted in the earth to where every day they wake up and see death. That will tell them all the time that they lack life. When they think they lack life, they'll enlist their own ability to try to give themselves life. And then that will bring forth my fruit in their life. And so what happens, man, is that it's, a, it's not a bad thing to pray or to want to be set free from your struggles, but you don't want it to become the meditation of your heart. And you, if it has become, there's no shame in that. Like, there was no shame for me when that happened to me, but you want to just kind of realize what's happening and be like, oh. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, so how can the cares of the world, wor- the cares of the world choke out the word? Um, and I, and I kind of already talked about this, but our eyes, what happens is our eyes can get set on our circumstances and the affliction we're experiencing. They get set on the calamity we see in our lives or in the world around us. Our affection can get set on what we think we need to overcome. It can get set on the thing we want to see victory over in our lives. And then that becomes the meditation of our hearts instead of the word of life that is Jesus. We'll spend all of our time thinking of our affliction. All of our time thinking about what's coming against us. All of our time thinking about if only this can change, all will be well. If only the circumstance can change, then I can have peace and joy. And then that chokes out the power of the word to bring forth peace and joy in our lives. It'll act like a weed that chokes out the vine that brings forth the fruit. Okay, that's how it chokes it out. It'll be as a weed in our heart choking out the power of the word of life to bring forth its fruit in us. That's how it happens, okay? And I think so many of us don't really understand how God brings forth life in us. He doesn't come and wave a magic wand. Listen, when we were ignorant of how God brought forth life and we needed life, he came and did signs and wonders so we could be like, oh, there's life in that guy. And we still rejoice in signs and wonders, man. I love signs and wonders and miracles, but I rejoice greater now in experiencing peace and love and joy that's never-ending. I've I've talked about this in the Bible study, but our faith is not in signs, wonders, and miracles. We don't need signs, wonders, and miracles to have peace. You see how quickly it shifts over? We, We found ourselves in the place where we thought we needed signs, wonders, and miracles to have peace. No, no, no. You need the word of life to have peace. You can have peace whether you see a sign, wonder, or miracle or not. In fact, When your faith is in the word of life, the peace that will bring forth will be a sign, wonder, and a miracle. (laughs) We've made the fruit the thing our faith was in. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like we thought, I need a miracle to have peace. And it got twisted. You don't need a miracle to have peace, man. The miracle that will bring you peace happened in the resurrection. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. And so we want to understand what kind of a being we are. And because we, didn't, we don't understand how God brings forth fruit in us, we don't understand how the meditating on our struggles, our afflictions, how it can choke out the Word. And so guys, we're the kind of being that lives from the heart. The Scriptures talk about us being the kind of being that lives from the heart. And so what it means that we're the kind of being that lives from the heart, it means that whatever the meditation of our heart is, will play a big role in what we experience. Whatever the meditation of our heart is will play a big role in whether or not we experience peace and joy. That's how the thing works. What is the meditation of your heart? And so 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 many times we run down the road meditating on our struggle all the time wondering why we don't have peace and joy. Well, listen, man. Your struggle doesn't contain peace and joy in it. So if that's what you're all the time meditating on, 
How do you expect to get peace and joy out of that? <laughs> you know, if I go and eat a steak, I don't expect to, ha- to get green beans out of it. If I go and order a big steak, I don't expect the person to come and deliver green beans to me. And none of you would think that, all of you would think I was crazy if that's what I expected. It's like sometimes we don't realize it, but we're meditating on our affliction. We're meditating on our circumstances. We're meditating on how they need to change in order for us to have life. And then we wonder why we don't have peace and joy. We don't have peace and joy because the thing we're meditating on doesn't possess peace and joy. And we're sucking out of the thing we're meditating on. Whatever it is we're meditating on is what we're going to absorb into ourselves. Whatever it is we're meditating on, because we're the kind of being that lives from the heart, that's going to be the thing that animates our life. So if we're meditating on our struggle and how we're tormented by something, guess what we're going to be animated with? Frustration and torment. Your affliction doesn't contain peace and joy. So if that's the thing you're meditating on, if that's what you're chewing on, if that's what you're digesting all the time, guess what you're going to get out of that? Torment and frustration. You guys follow what I'm saying? You see how that chokes out the Word? And because we don't understand, the Word is something God comes to drop in our hearts. And then He wants that Word. It's a seed. A seed has to be watered. It has to be cultivated. Do you know how a seed is cultivated in the heart of a human being? They twist on it. They chew on it. They digest it. They meditate on it. And then it cultivates that seed. And then that seed grows. But if we're not meditating on the Word of life, and in fact we're meditating on a Word that's contrary to the Word of life, how are we ever going to get the of peace and joy that's contained in the word of life you ain't and then frustration will set in then you'll start coming up with things like my god my god why have you forsaken me <laughs> all the while god's like listen man <laughs> i haven't forsaken you i'll never forsake you You guys follow that dynamic, how it works? We're the kind of being. That's how meditation works. As you think on something, you're twisting on it. You're chewing on it, right? You're moving it around. You're digesting it when you think about something. You're dwelling on it. You're twisting on it. You're chewing on it. You know like when you chew on something, you chew on it to get the flavor and the nutrients out of it? That there's something contained in the thing you put in your mouth, and then when you want to get what's in there, out of it, into your body, you chew on it. And as you chew on it, the flavor comes out, the nutrients come out, you begin to digest it, and it begins to be able to strengthen your life. That's what meditation is like. You're chewing on it. You're twisting on it. Because there's something contained in this thing you're meditating on, and the way that you absorb what's contained there is by chewing on it, twisting on it, thinking about it dwelling on it. That's how the thing works, man. That's the way that meditation works. Chewing on something helps you to absorb the flavor and the nutrients, doesn't it? I mean, the piece of steak, if I put the piece of steak in my mouth, it, it tastes okay just sitting in my mouth, but it's much better if I chew it, isn't it? I mean, I might get a sense of what it, what's there if I just stick it in my mouth, but if I don't ever chew it, man, I'm not really absorbing the nutrients or the flavor that's contained there, am I? And so that's how it is with the word of life, man. So many of us have believed on the word of grace. We've, we've taken that word of grace into our hearts, but then we're not chewing on it. We're not twisting on it. We're not thinking about it. It's not the meditation of our heart. We're meditating all the time on the cares of the world. We're meditating all the time on the life in the world. Well, the life in the world lacks, man. That's why God came and conquered the world. You're dead to the life in the world. The reason why we were crucified with Christ is so we could be divorced from the life in the world because the life in the world doesn't possess peace. It doesn't possess joy. It doesn't possess love. It doesn't possess kindness. It doesn't possess meekness. It doesn't possess faith. But then that's what we're all the time meditating on. That's what we're chewing on, the life in the world. And what do you think we're sucking out of that life? Well, if that life lacks life, what you're sucking out of it is, I lack life. (laughs) You see? You see how that works? Meditating on something is like digesting it. You know, like you, you digest something to suck the nutrients out of it. 
It's like I said this in the Bible study, but in high school, you know, we, we're in the sticks kind of, for those of you that don't, that don't know. Um, this is like sportsman's paradise, hunting and all those kinds of things. So I had a lot of friends that were into hunting, and, man, they, they like to chew tobacco. And so they put a big chaw in their mouth all the time in high school, like a big lip sticking out with some chaw in there. The reason they did that is because they would go hunting early in the morning, and that nicotine in the tobacco would keep them awake. It was like a stimulant. So they'd put that tobacco in their lip, and they'd suck the juice out of it. They'd absorb the nicotine in the tobacco into their body, and then their body would be animated by the nicotine. That would keep them up at 2 or 3 in the morning when they're out in the marsh, waist deep, trying to shoot some ducks. You see what I'm saying? That's how meditation is. If you can understand what I'm saying. If you put a piece of gum in your mouth, but you never chew it, you might get a sense of what that gum tastes like, but if you bite into it and start chewing it, you're really going to get the flavor, aren't you? You're really going to get the juice in that gum. And you're going to be like, yeah, man, that's some good gum. Bubblicious. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so, guys, when you're meditating on something, you're absorbing into yourself all the things that are contained in whatever it is you're meditating on. You're absorbing it into yourself. You're absorbing it into your life. Your life is now being animated by whatever it is you're meditating on. Okay? You guys follow that? And, you know, I remember when I was like 12 years old, and from 12 all the way through the time I was a teenager, um, I, lis there, I listened to a lot of bands, and I don't mean to disparage this band because I still like their music, and so I'm not speaking evil of the band. I'm just using it as an example. But from when I was like 12 till I was like 19, I listened to a lot of Pink Floyd, a whole lot of Pink Floyd, okay? And they're great musicians, great, uh, you know, songwriters, all that kind of stuff. But if you don't know a lot about Pink Floyd, many, many, many of their songs are sad and depressing and just filled with hopelessness and sorrow and all that kind of stuff, like to an umpteenth degree. I mean, I didn't realize it back then what was going on, but now I look back and I think, man, it's a miracle I'm still alive after dwelling. I mean, I could probably quote every lyric of every one of their albums. And when I start to think about them and quote them, my goodness, man, they're like so depressing and so sad. But as I listened to these songs as a, as a teenager and a preteen, what happened was those lyrics became the meditation of my heart where I was all the time riding my bike through the neighborhood singing the songs, twisting on the words, twisting on what it meant, thinking about the songs, thinking about the words, thinking about everything those things meant, man. And what happened was, what do you think happened when those things became the meditation of my heart? Well, those things only possess sadness and sorrow and depression and hopelessness, right? Well, what do you think happened to me as I started twisting on those things? It animated me. It animated my life with sadness and sorrow and depression and hopelessness. Just for me twisting on it, thinking about it, singing it, being into it. Meditation. It's just an example of what happens with meditation. You see, their lyrics were like a seed. And that seed got planted in my heart. And as I meditated on that seed, it cultivated that seed inside of me. And the seed that it cultivated inside of me, that seed contained sorrow. It contained sadness. It contained depression. It contained hopelessness. And so the more I meditated on that seed, the more that seed in my heart gave birth to a big tree of depression. Because that's how meditation works in the heart of a human being. That's how meditation works in the heart of a human being. Glory to God for deliverance. So guys, it's the same way, all that stuff we talked about with meditation, the way the, the meat and all those things work, it's the same way with the cares of the world and the word of life. It's the same way. There's something contained in those things. There's something contained in the cares of the world, and there's something contained in the word of life. And whichever one becomes the meditation of our heart is what we're going to absorb into ourselves and what's going to animate our life. If the word of life becomes the meditation of our heart, that word possesses an incorruptible peace and joy. And if that's what we're meditating on, 
we're going to find ourselves absorbing peace and joy into our, our spirit, souls, and bodies, and we'll find our whole lives animated with peace and joy. But if we're meditating on the cares of the world, the cares of the world possess torment, frustration, discouragement, lack. Those are the things contained in that seed. And if that's what we're meditating on, the cares of the world, what we need a victory over, what our afflictions are, what we think we need to have peace, what will happen is, is we'll cultivate a seed in our hearts that only, that only contains lack and frustration and torment. And then that will animate our lives. That will animate our whole spirit, souls, and bodies. And next thing we know, we find we're all the time tormented. We're never experiencing peace and joy. And we wonder why. And then we blame the word of grace. Right? Or we blame God. You guys follow me? What does Andrew say? It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. Does, why did he ever say that? It's like something I didn't get. Is that? I just knew he said it. I never could figure out why. I was like, is he in a Presbyterian church? Why is he saying that? Glory to God. What's that? Oh, he was? Okay, when he said that? All right, well, now it makes sense. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. So guys, sometimes we get so caught up in wanting to see victory in an area that it becomes the meditation of our hearts instead of the meditation of our hearts being what God has said and done in Jesus to give us life. We find ourselves in the place where we're struggling to experience peace and joy, the, the peace and joy Christ has come to give us because the meditation of our hearts is our worries and our concerns. The meditation of our hearts is daily about our struggles and what we want victory over. Our affection gets set on what we're struggling with. Our affection gets set on our circumstances as if the power for us to be able to experience peace and joy is found in our circumstances. I remember a time in my own life, like four or five years ago, and I mentioned it at the beginning, where, man, I was being tormented by something in my life. Some, a circumstance going on in my life was bringing me great pain. And before I knew it every day the meditation of my heart was this circumstance and if this circumstance could change all would be well everything would be great everything would be peachy keen and so every day I woke up feeling tormented and frustrated because the circumstance had it changed and if it could only change then I would have peace and before the day even started I'd wake up like this hunched over knowing the circumstance hadn't changed. And so then all day I would be thinking about what's the key to the circumstance changing? What am I missing that isn't, that it's not going on? Where's the lie I need to pluck out so this circumstance can change? Lord, show me where my unbelief, I mean, all my talk with God was about this circumstance. And I went on like this a long time. Guess what never happened during any of that time? I never felt peace and joy, and I only felt more torment and more frustration. Why? Because I was meditating on my circumstances. And so I kept waiting for God to change my circumstances, change my circumstance, change my circumstance. Show me the thing that will change my circumstance. And one day, out of the blue, I hear God clearly say to me, hey, Greg, thought about the resurrection much, man. Considered the resurrection much lately. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh. Oh. It was like instantaneously he changed the meditation in my heart. That's all he had to say. You thought on the resurrection much lately, Greg? Boom, like immediately on the spot, man, I started thinking about the resurrection as it pertained to my life. I started immediately seeing how my life had overcome the world. I started immediately thinking on how the life I have in this mortal body actually came out of the grave how the life I have in this mortal body actually created the whole universe. I started thinking about how everything in this world that can steal peace came against the life that I have, and the life that I had came out of the grave. I started thinking on that. I started thinking about how I'd been raised up from the life in the world. I started thinking about how the life that's in the world isn't my life, but my life is hidden in Christ. I just started thinking about that right on the spot. Guess what happened? Joy and peace came. Because joy and peace is contained in that thing. And so all that needed to happen wasn't that my circumstance changed. All that needed to happen was the meditation in my heart needed to change. That quick, man. The circumstance hadn't changed. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, Peter walked on the water when he had his eyes on Jesus. It was a stormy water, a storm going on there. And then the moment he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. 
that really happened, but it's also declaring a spiritual truth. Peter was walking above the stormy waters of this world when his eyes were set on Jesus. He was walking above it. The moment he took his eyes off of Jesus, Jesus is the word of life there. We only think of Jesus as a person. We, it's like the bobblehead Jesus. Jesus the man. Jesus is the wisdom of God. He's the word of life. And so when Peter had his eyes on Jesus and he was walking above the stormy waters of this world, he had his eyes on the word of life. And that word of life that he had his eyes on was his meditation. And that word of life caused him to walk above the stormy waters. But the moment he took his eyes off of that word of life and he began meditating on the stormy waters, what do you think you're going to suck out or absorb of the stormy waters? Fear. And then he started to sink. You see how that works? Peter's meditation was the word of life. Then it became the storm. Then he sank. <laughs> Circumstances had nothing to do with it. It was the meditation in his heart that had something to do with it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Guys, I, I, I hope we can hear that we're a, how can I say this where people don't get confused? It's difficult. We have a body and we live by the Spirit. The thing that feeds our body with life is the Spirit. The nutrients we need for life is the Spirit. So when we're encountering negative circumstances, the thing we need ain't found in the circumstances. Are the circumstances changing? The thing that we need is nutrients from the spirit of life, okay? And so if when we encounter these negative circumstances, if we can begin fellowshipping with that word of life that Peter had his eyes set on, that spirit of truth that was manifested in Jesus, if we can begin focusing on that, that's the thing that we need. That's the nutrients we need that can give us peace and joy, not the circumstances changing. Because the moment we think the circumstances need to change for us to have peace and joy, that circumstance becomes the meditation of our heart. And so the thing that we need is the nutrients from the spirit of life, the spirit of truth, right? Right? so that that can become the meditation of our heart, that will always bring forth peace and joy. It will always bring forth peace and joy. When the cares of this world come to us, what we need is to be fed by the nutrients that come from the head that is Christ. And we're trying to suck nutrients out of our circumstances. Listen, it don't matter how many circumstances you can get to line up perfectly for you in this world, none of them possess the power to bring you out of the grave. None of them can keep you from the grave. You can't get everything perfectly lined up in this world, all your circumstances to look shiny and beautiful and think that that's going to give you eternal life. Well, peace and joy are the fruit of eternal life, not the fruit of good circumstances. We think peace and joy is the fruit of good circumstances. <laughs> what did Jesus say? I have come that you might have good circumstances. And from that, you can have life. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing wrong with having good circumstances. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying we're condemned to suffer. We're talking about when we encounter things that bring suffering to us. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, well, poor us, we're in this world and we're just going to suffer. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, so please understand what I'm saying. We're talking about experiencing a peace and joy that overcomes everything in this world. We're talking about a peace of joy that's not at the mercy of the circumstances in this world. We're talking about a peace and joy that will overcome all the circumstances in the world, that will cause you to walk above the circumstances in this world, that will fill you with a peace and a joy even should you experience a period of time where your circumstances ain't so good. Who wants a life that has to have all the circumstances line up in order to have peace? I rejected that life a long time ago because I worked hard to get the circumstances to line up, and I used the gospel to do it, and it didn't work. And I'm pretty diligent. I'm pretty disciplined. I mean, I ran 130-something miles a week. I worked a full-time job. I mean, I was a disciplined guy. You can't get your circumstances to line up well enough. That's a cursed life. That's a cursed life. That's a life filled with laboring and toiling. We'll finish up with this verse. Glory to God. Philippians 4, 7 and 4, 8. You guys have been patient. Thank you so much for letting me preach for so long all the time. I love you guys. I, I require long messages for my heart. 
But just know that as you're sitting here, you're meditating. You're meditating. We, we, we don't come to church to make God happy. We don't come to church for an academic exercise. We come to church because as we're sitting here, we're meditating on the spirit of life. All week long, you're out there encountering things that are making you meditate on something. And so when we come to church, man, we're meditating on the spirit of life so we can find peace and joy. Philippians 4, 7, and 8. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Meditate on these things. Chew on these things. Twist on these things, Paul says. Now listen to what Paul's talking about here. First he says there's a peace that passes understanding. You know what he's talking about there. There's a peace that doesn't make sense to the world. <laughs> because there's a peace you can have that doesn't depend on the circumstances in the world. It passes understanding. It doesn't make sense, right? When Paul was hanging in the jail, singing, when he was hung up, and they were beating him down, and he's hanging in feces and, and whatever you want to call it, the, the lowliest of the lows, and he was singing, he had a peace that passed understanding, right? All of us could have looked on that and said, it don't make no sense that this guy has peace. It passes understanding, right? That's what Paul's talking about there. He's saying there's a peace that is not at the mercy of what's going on in the world. There's a peace that can't be corrupted by the tribulation in the world. And this peace can keep your heart and your mind. This peace can keep your heart and your mind, Paul's talking about there. So how does Paul say that the peace of God keeps your hearts and minds? What will fill your hearts and minds with this peace? Paul says it's Christ Jesus. It says this peace will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. So it's Christ Jesus that possesses the power to keep your heart and mind in peace. It's Christ Jesus that possesses the power to keep your heart and mind filled with this peace that passes understanding, that doesn't make any sense to the world, that doesn't make any sense to the carnal mind. It's Christ Jesus that can fill you with the kind of peace Paul was filled with when he was hanging in the jail in the worst circumstances in the whole world and he was singing. Paul wasn't praying to be delivered. He was rejoicing in the word of life. It kept his heart and his mind filled with the peace in the midst of a very stormy water. You see what I'm saying there? Now listen, when Paul talks about Christ Jesus, we've gotten so deficient in our understanding of Jesus that we only see Jesus as a person. And yes, Jesus is a person. But when Paul calls it Christ Jesus, he's not just talking about the man, he's talking about the wisdom that was made flesh in Jesus. He's talking about a wisdom. He's talking about the word of life that was made flesh in Jesus. He's saying the way that your heart and your mind can be kept by this peace that passes understanding is for your heart and your mind to all the time be thinking on the word of life that is Christ Jesus. He's talking about for the wisdom of God that was made flesh in Jesus. In his birth, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension. He's talking about our hearts and our minds will be kept in peace through our hearts being filled with those things. Right? Meditation. The very next verse he gets on to, finally, brethren, if there be anything good, anything worthy of praise, anything just, think on those things. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about everything God did in Christ Jesus. He justified us in Christ Jesus. He conquered our death in Christ Jesus. He raised us up unto eternal life in Christ Jesus. He reconciled himself to the world in Christ Jesus. He sat us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He got down on bended knee and adored us in Christ Jesus. He blessed us with the promise of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. Man, if you think on those things, you'll find yourself feeling like the Fonz. You'll find yourself walking around knowing, well, I don't need no money for that jukebox. I'll just... It don't matter if I don't have no oil in my car. I'll just give it a little bump. A little bump, a little hip bump, a little hip check. You know? A little boom. <laughs> a little booty bump. 
You see? You see what I'm saying, man? And so when Paul says our hearts and minds are kept in peace through Christ Jesus. And then think on that. Think on that, he says. Let that be the meditation of your heart, man. There's praise in that. There's justice in that. There's freedom in that. There's life in that. There's peace and joy in that, man. That's what Paul's saying there. It's a profound thing he's saying there. He's saying, let what God has said and done in Christ Jesus be the meditation of your heart. That's what he's saying, man. Glory to God for him saying that. <laughs> that's how peace will rule in your life. Meditating on Christ Jesus. You'll find peace ruling is what will happen. You'll find peace ruling over your life. You'll find peace causing you to walk on the stormy water. You'll find peace causing you to live above the stormy water. You'll find peace causing you to overcome the cares of this world. You'll find peace keeping your heart and your mind from the cares of the world is what you'll find. You'll find peace serving you. Glory to God. Guys, and we'll finish with this, but meditation is effortless, okay? You don't tr have to try to meditate on it. You're all the time meditating. It's a function of your design. You're meditating now. So meditation is effortless. We're always meditating on something. It's constantly going on in us. It's not something we have to work up. It's an effortless thing. It's just we want the meditation of our hearts to be the word of life, okay? And back to the song that gets stuck in your head, Okay? Back to the song that gets stuck in your head. That's the same way that it works with the gospel. The gospel can get stuck in your head. It can get stuck in your head where that's the song in your heart all the time. It can get stuck in your head where that's the thing you're always thinking about. And when it gets stuck in your head and you're all the time thinking about it, it will always give birth to peace and joy. Always. Always. Okay, and there's a few ways that this can happen to us. We can hear a message. We don't hear a message to get academic understanding, although we may also get some of that. We don't hear messages to make God happy. We don't hear messages because we're supposed to. We're not trying to attain to something. We hear messages so the song that is the gospel can get stuck in our hearts and be the meditation of our hearts. That's why we hear message. It could be through praise and worship. It could be through sitting and talking with people face to face about the gospel. You could sit around the table and talk the gospel. You can be on the phone talking the gospel. You can sit quietly and talk with God. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, nobody knew the gospel but him. And so he could talk to them, but man, that wasn't going to help him out. He went and talked with God. You can get quiet with God. And talk with God about what he's done through Jesus. You can talk with God about what that means pertaining to your life. That will be a tree of life to you. It will keep the word producing fruit in your heart. And so there's a lot of things that we do. We don't do it out of obligation, but we do it just to hear the word of life. It says faith comes by hearing. Faith isn't just talking about your ability to believe there. It's saying there's a faith. This faith has existed in God from the beginning. This faith came in the body of Jesus. And when you hear this faith, this faith comes to you and dwells in your heart. And oh, by the way, this faith produces peace, love, joy, kindness, long-suffering, meekness. And so when we hear the faith, the faith becomes the meditation of our heart. And then when we twist on the faith and think on the faith and meditate on the faith, then that faith produces peace and joy. It's that simple, man. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so that's why we hear. And so we're not hearing to try to work something. We're not hearing to try to understand everything Greg said. So if we can figure it out, we'll get the thing. No, no, no. We're just hearing so we can meditate on the word of life and the gospel can become the word stuck in our hearts. Glory to God. It's a simple sentence your heart could get stuck on. I was crucified with Christ to death. I was raised up with Christ to an incorruptible life. That becomes the meditation of your heart. That's all you need. If you're all the time thinking of that, you encounter something in this world that stinks, I was crucified with Christ to death, and I was raised up with Christ to an incorruptible life. You'll feel peace and joy everywhere. 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 That's it. Just that simple sentence. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your life. Thank you for your wisdom. I just thank you, Lord, for your word of life and, and the way you designed us, that your word is not... Um, incompatible with us, but it's actually the most compatible thing with us that there is. I just thank you, Father, that the most natural thing for us 
is to find your word of life as the meditation of our hearts. And Father, we just commit our desire to find um, the word of life as our meditation into your hands. We have this desire that we could walk around and daydream about this word of life. And Father, we just commit this desire into your hands. We're so thankful that you're faithful to captivate our imaginations with your word of life, that you're faithful to bring forth this meditation in our heart, that you're faithful to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If anybody wants prayer, I'll lay hands on you. Here, we'll do it this way so I don't break it. Hey, good morning. Everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, I was sitting there and everything, uh, I, I just felt like uh, as Greg's talking, God's speaking to me, and I, I'm like, everything in me is like, I don't want to get up the front. I do not want to get up in the front. You know, one of the things that I've always uh, dealt with in my life is fear. The fear of, 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 of myself, fear of what other people are going to think of me, you know, and it's constantly there. And everything in me is like, man, I've got to cover myself. I've got to cover myself with fig leaves. I'm just going to sit there. I'm not going to come up here. I'm going to sit there. But I found something in me to say no. No. His life has overcome that. That is greater than that. And I was rem reminded of the verse where it talks, I think it's in Ephesians 2.10, where it says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And I felt God say this morning that, that for many of us, it, it's knowing that you are God's workmanship, that you are as you ought to be, that you are loved from eternity to eternity. With a psalmist, I mean, we, we see these scriptures and we've read them a million times, and then sometimes it's like the light bulb comes on and you, you can actually relate that to yourself, that before you were born in your mother's womb, that God knew you and he predestined you and he loved you just as the way that you are. And I felt for for people either online or for people here, that you are as you ought to be, that you are loved, that you can't be loved any more than you possibly can be loved. There's nothing wrong. Everything in this world is trying to tell you that you're not the right height, you're not the right weight, you don't look the right way, you don't have the right job, you don't have a partner. Everything is coming at you and saying that, that to you. And it's lying to you. And the truth is, is that your life is in Christ and that you've been raised. And you are his workmanship. And if that verse where I used to think that you are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works, I used to think that's good works, that's doing good stuff. The reality is the good work. What is the good work? What did Jesus say? Jesus said that, that if you believe on me, that is the only work. That is the good work that we are called into. That is the work that God does in you and through you again and again and again. And I also just felt just, uh, you know, just for, uh, I felt for Steve. Is it Steve? Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just felt like I just had a picture for you of one of these pinball machines. And it's like when the ball goes and you pull it back and it goes bounce from side to side to side. And, it, you know, it goes one side to the other side to the other side. I felt like you know, for, for maybe a lot of your life that it, it felt like circumstances that things have happened. Think, you know, you bounce from side to side and, side and you go, you're like, what's going on? But I feel that as you come into grace, I'm reminded of where David says that, um, he talks about that, that, that God prepares a table in the midst of, of your enemies and he prepares a banquet and he prepares a feast. And I just saw, instead of you feeling like you're going from side to side to side to side, that you now see a table and that you're seated in him and that you're with him and that in the midst of everything that's going on around you, where before you would feel like you were bouncing, that now you're sitting down at his table and he's preparing a feast for you and feeding you the word of life and the bread of life every day and that that is where you, you're feasting on and feasting on and feasting. And it's like God says, don't get up from the chair, man. Regardless of what the circumstances are around you, I've got you, I've got your back, I've got good things for you. And it's not like he brings the same thing every day. His mercy and his goodness and his kindness is new each and every day. It says, you know, I remember it talks about that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand is treasures forevermore. That God just says, keep in the seat. Everything in the world might be telling you to to you've got to go over here, 
or you've got to do this, or you've got to say that. And you're like, you know, you're like, no. I, I, I know where I am, and I know who I am. And I just see that more and more and more and more and more. I just felt for both a couple, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. I just um, had the word um, uh, lighthouse. And I, one thing, I, I listened to Dave, and is that Dave, and what's Dave? Dave, Dave and Bonnie, and I remember listening to a preach, I think, I was reminded of it, where he talked about that he never, um, he always let God, like whenever he had his, uh, his ministry, that God would just open up the doors. He'd never like plan anything. And I felt for both of you that, that, that you're a lighthouse in dark places. And I felt that, that, that out of you, that there was wisdom and that, and that God was going to use you and you're going to get invited to places out of the blue, and God will orchestrate that. It's like God is your travel planner. <laughs> God is the one who opens up the doors, and that you don't need to worry about what's going to happen in a year's time, what's going to happen in six months' time, just that you will, that, that, that God will just open doors. And I felt also the word uh, international as well. I felt that I just, I just had this picture of the globe, and I just see you kind of traveling back and forward and, you know, getting lots of points. <laughs> but, 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 no, that, 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 you know, where you go, that you will impart wisdom, you will impart life. And sometimes we might not even see it in this world. And that when we go to be with him, that there will be people who come to you and say, you know, you know what? You said that and you've spoken to my life and you'll be like, like, you'll be amazed at God do, does in you. Um, you know, so just, just be encouraged. Uh, but yeah, just this morning, that you're God's workmanship that he loves you, that he's passionate about you, and that uh, that's what I've got. So, all right. Hallelujah. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? Anything they want to say? Glory to God. All right, Mr. Ted. Two hours? As, as long as you like, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, basically, I just wanted to thank you. We, can't, we were, just spent three, three days with some grandkids down at Gulf Shores on the beach, and we're heading over to my sister's. And I was just looking at the time, and I said, you know, you know who's in between point A and point B? And if we leave at 6.30 or so, we could, we could hit slide L just, just right. I needed the message because we forget. We forget. And we... Uh, just, I'll say this briefly. My wife and I, for the last two years, have been doing house sitting full time. We just finished our uh, 22nd house sit in uh, Florida in, in, the, in the villages for three months over the summer. And then we came up to Nashville to see our grandkids and stuff. And then, like I said, we came down and had to cross. We kind of took September off to see family and so forth. But, so we leave Florida. While we're in Florida, just as we're leaving, Harvey comes into Houston, you know, in that area, devastating. So we leave Florida, we go up to Huntsville. The night we pulled in to uh, actually, uh, Huntsville, sorry, um, Nashville. Uh, the night we pulled in to our son's house, uh, we woke up the next morning now, we heard some chainsaws during the night. It woke us up, and then we thought it was down the street. We didn't think about it. We woke up, looked out the back, and a tree had fallen right, right between my son's car and my car, totaled his $7,000 worth of damage to mine. <laughs> and so it's in the shop now. So we get a rental, and all I'm thinking is, okay, uh, okay, we're on a kind of a fixed income, fixed a little lower than we'd rather, <laughs> but it's fixed. <laughs> and uh, I've got a five th or five hundred dollar deductible, and so they give us a rental car. So we drive that down to Gulf Shores, and uh, we, I had it for. Uh, I don't know, four or five days prior to that. And every other day, I got to air up the tire. 
one of the tires. So I get down to Gulf Shores and I stop to have somebody take a look at it. It's got a nail in it near the, near the, about an inch in from the edge. Went to, what, three, three different places? Well, the th uh, two places, and then the third place, they confirmed. They said, no, it's too close to the edge. We can't fix it. So I called the rental company, say, hey, look, the tire was like this. Yeah, we got it. I couldn't, couldn't get any. In fact, on my phone, I, I took a picture. You know how you can do it on your smartphone and uh, put it on the, the, the rental company's uh, 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 on their uh, Facebook page <laughs> with a picture of that. Thirteen times I'd call their repair thing only to get a business busy signal. So I, I'd lost my peace and joy. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, okay, all I want is a tree to fall on their building, <laughs> a big tree. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't think that. But I was just frustrated. You know, it's, it's easy. You can get caught up in circumstances so easy. And I look back on my life. God's always provided. Yeah, we're still here. We're still going. We always will. You know, we went, we just, we spent, well, from December to May in New Zealand, house city. And uh, I didn't have the money to get over there. Well, there we were, <laughs> you know, and we had five house hits, and we, I mean, we had some, some really lovely, lovely places. I mean, New Zealand is a beach. It's a beautiful country with a beach all the way around, and fjords, and everybody's, well, you guys are close to beaches, but uh, in Wisconsin, where we spent the last 40 years, um, we had beaches, too. But they were little muddy lakes, <laughs> you know, thousands of them. Well, they were not muddy. They have that tamarack, that kind of a brown, most of them are like kind of brown water. Clean, but brown. Anyway, long story short, you guys have been here a long time. You don't know what you got. I mean, and he's right. We listen, I mean, the world listens to this guy. And he is long-winded. But you know what? You're just getting a seven-course meal instead of three. You know, you are blessed. Anyway, that's all Thank I have. You. Thank you. Glory yeah. to God. Thank you. Listen, if anybody wants prayer, we'll lay hands on you. Glory to God. Have a good day. We love you.